This is the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 18th chapter. It reads, If another member of the church sins against you, go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. If the member listens to you, you have regained that one. But if you are not listened to, take one or two others along with you, so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If the member refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if the offender refuses to listen even to the church, let such a one be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I tell you, Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly I tell you, if two of you agree on earth about anything you ask, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Well, grace to you all in peace from God our Creator and from Jesus Christ, our risen Lord and Savior. Amen. So the Gospel lesson before us today, Matthew 18, it's the, uh, how should I say, it's, the, it's one of the common sense directions from Jesus that we get that we know it makes sense and we know it's true and we know it's right. But I'll ask for a show of hands. Um, how many regularly do that one about um, if somebody sins against you, uh, go directly to that person? I'm glad I don't see any. Oh, I saw one hand up back there. Somebody asked me this this morning after reading this passage. They said, Pastor Lyle, um, how often have you seen the church? Or do you ever see the church actually practice this? And before I think even a split second, um, uh, before a split second happened after that question, I just said, nope, I don't see it. Because it's extremely, extremely hard. It is. So somebody makes you mad, what do you do? You go to somebody else and tell them all about how that jerk made you mad. And on the reverse, how often do you have somebody coming up to you and saying, I am so sorry, I think I did this to you. It doesn't happen very often, does it? It's like Jesus knew our DNA, the makeup of how we function. So that's how we mess up. And we keep messing up the same way over and over and over, and that's fine. But that's how we mess up. I think this passage goes way beyond it. It's more than just a simple direction. It's not, it's not a passage, it's not direction from Jesus about what to do. Yeah, Jesus says, you know, somebody sins against you, go, get, go to him directly. Have it out with them directly. And then if you can't solve it there, bring two or three with you. And then if you still can't solve it, bring in the whole church. Yeah, it's a what. But that actually doesn't get at the heart of what Jesus is getting at. The question I posted uh, on my Facebook and all throughout the week was in my mind is this. It's who is in your church? This is a who question. It's not a what question. It's a who. Someone who has sinned against you. You go to them yourself. It's a who. And if it's still not solved, what do you do? You take a couple others who's with you. And then if it's still not solved, bring it to the church. Still a couple of more who's. 
And if it's still not solved, what do you do? You treat them like a Gentile or a tax collector. And how did Jesus treat Gentiles and tax collectors? He loved them. That's what he did. So who is in your church? Here's what I want you to do. I want you to turn to each other and talk about that question, who is in your church, um, but you have to, um, I'm only going to make one rule, well, two rules. They have to be reasonably friendly, and the person you talk to has to be either half your age or twice your age. Go ahead. I was a little afraid with somebody I talked to, and I asked who's in your church, and she looked at me, and she said, sinners. And I thought, oh, no. She's talking about me. It's a who question. And at the heart of what we do is we want to make our church the ones, and I'm not talking about the A-frame known as First English. I'm talking about the kingdom of God and who's right and who's wrong and who's on the inside and who's on the outside. What we continually want to do is to make it smaller. That jerk who sinned against me, he's out. And I'm going to go tell my friend who agrees with me, that jerk is out. We continually want to make it smaller. Lutherans were great at this. 500 years, we still haven't figured out how to stop posting feces on church doors. You mean we don't agree with them on the doctrine of justification? Nope, they're out. They have different communion practices than us? Nope, they're out. They don't understand baptism the way we do? They're out. Pick whatever it is. They don't agree with us. No, they're not. They're out. We make it smaller. And this is a passage about how Jesus is making it bigger. This past week, I had a wonderful conversation with somebody. Um, There was nobody at the church, church building at First English. And the FedEx driver came and he delivered a package. And the guy said to me, he said, Pastor Lyle, I hope it's okay that I sign for this package. And I said, of course it's okay. You're from the church. And he kind of nodded and said, yeah, I suppose that is right. And I said, yeah. And it even gets greater than that. Anyone who communes at our altar rail can sign for the package. And he kind of looked at me and said, wow, really? I said, yes, that is our understanding of the church. Anyone who communes at the altar rail. And he said, well, that's pretty cool. And I said, yeah, and it even gets better. Anyone who's died, uh, the saints who've gone before us, who kneeled at the altar rail before us, they're members of the church too. Because when we commune at that altar rail, what we're also doing is we're communing with everyone who's gone before us. And he smiled, and then I said, I don't think FedEx would let a dead person sign, though. (laughs) Then one of my friends said, no, it gets even bigger, Lyle. You're forgetting all the saints to come. This is a passage not about an instruction of what to do, about what, what is right or what is wrong. This is an instruction. It's a message about how big Jesus wants to make the kingdom. And that's where the gospel is. We mess up because we don't have a, a chance of doing this one right. We don't do it right. It's very hard. We don't have a chance. But where's that gospel? At the end, that last line... Wherever two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them.
Wherever two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. See, because we mess up. And if we practiced by the rules, if God practiced by the rules that we'd like, we'd be cast out too. But God doesn't work that way. Nope. That's the gospel. We're still in. Though we don't deserve it, though we don't belong, in spite of all that, the church exists wherever two or three of us, nice vague ambiguity, wherever two or three of us are gathered in Christ's name. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.